John Adams Letters from the Front podcast for May 1916. This podcast looks at life in World War I through the letters of John Adams, who was 23 when he joined up in September 1914. He served with the 9th Service Battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, and was involved in many significant events on the Western Front, particularly Passchendaele. These are his words, read by his grandchildren, and narrated by his great-grandchildren. This month is one of the important months of the war for John Adams. He was wounded, and while that is something that takes a full year for him to heal before he returns to the front line, it probably saved his life. In the letters we hear of him mentioning the Easter Rising, and he also gives an account of how he was wounded, in his own words, to his mother. We also hear the frustration that he isn't receiving the letters that are being sent from home because he's away from his unit, and he even tells his mother off for worrying about him. In the history section, we look at how wounds were treated in the Western Front. My name is Mark Adams, and John Adams was my grandfather. On May the 1st, 1916, John Adams was shot in the left hand as a result of an accidental discharge by another soldier in Averley Wood as they were preparing to go up to the trenches near Hamill on the Somme. Averley is about 2.5 kilometres behind the front line at Hamill. While information on soldiers who were killed was recorded in many places, hardly any formal record exists for those who were injured and survived. We are fortunate to have the account, not only from John Adams himself, as you will hear in the letters, but from his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel S.W.W. Blacker, who wrote to his wife Eva almost every day. These letters can be found at blackersletters.com. Rumours about Ireland are numerous. We had a man, Lance Corporal Adams, accidentally shot through the hand yesterday evening. We can only speculate about what happened next. When injuries happened in the trenches, the wounded man was collected by stretcher bearers and moved out of the forward trenches by a combination of people, horse and car, and later by motorised ambulance. Men would be moved until they reached a location where they could be treated for their specific injury. Casualty clearing stations were part of the casualty evacuation chain, further back from the front line than aid posts and field ambulances. They were manned by troops of the Royal Army Medical Corps, with attached Royal Engineers and men of the Army Service Corps. The job of the CCS was to treat a man sufficiently for his return to duty, or, in most cases, to enable him to be evacuated to a base hospital. It was not a place for long-term stay. Casualty clearing stations were generally located on or near railway lines, so casualties could be moved to the hospitals easily. Although they were quite large, they moved quite frequently. Surgery was often performed at the casualty clearing stations, arms and legs were amputated and wounds were operated on. Severe wounds to limbs on many thousands of soldiers meant amputation. According to historian Julie Anderson, in France a guillotine, a variation on the one used to cut off heads in the French Revolution, was used to amputate limbs. As traumatic as it was, amputation saved the lives of many men, as it often prevented infection. Infected wounds were a major problem that could lead to illness and death. There were no antibiotics at this time, so special care was taken to clean wounds and cut away infected tissue. Being wounded in the left hand may have brought you under suspicion of a self-inflicted wound, as there was a fear that is a way for men to avoid the danger and horror of the trenches. Doctors were instructed to be vigilant in cases of malingering, where soldiers pretended to be ill or wounded themselves so they did not have to fight. It was a common belief of the medical profession that wounds on the left hand were suspicious. But we do know that John Adams survived his wound, and that the accident more than likely saved his life. He would however spend a full year in recovery before he came back to the Western Front in May 1917. Somewhere in France, 13th of May, 1916. My dear mother, just a few lines now that I am able to write once more to let you know that I am getting on alright. Hoping yourself and all at home are still keeping in your usual good health. I suppose by this time you will think me dead, but thank goodness I am still in the land of the living. After I got wounded, the chaplain promised to write to you and tell you, and so did Jack. Did they do so? 
You see, I have not gotten a letter since then, and I may tell you that many times I wondered how yous were getting on at home. And many a time I was very sorry that I could not write to let you know how I was doing, but as my hand is getting all right, I will try and explain to you how it happened. It was a Monday night, the 1st of May, and we were out of the trenches at that time, but the battalion that we were doing reserves to was supposed to be attacked, and we got orders to go up to support them. It was about 10 o'clock at night, and very dark, and when outside our quarters the order was given to load up our rifles, so I happened to be rather late getting out, and when I got out I was standing sideways to where the men were, and one of them by accident let off a round. The bullet passed through my rifle and exploded it in my left hand, the splinters tearing the whole heart of, out of my hand. I had to go through two operations for me to get them out. It did feel sore, I'ma tell you. But don't be uneasy as I am getting all right now, as I have the worst of it over me, and it might have been far worse if I had lost my hand. The weather is still keeping very wet now. It is simply pouring today. I suppose it is much the same at home. How is Annie and Jimmy getting on? I'm sorry I cannot write to them, as all my writing paper is in my rucksack and this is all I've got with me. But I may tell you many a time, when lying here I thought often about you all, and I did not know how yous were doing, as I did not get a letter from anyone since I got wounded. That is nearly a fortnight today. I wish my hand was better until I would get out again, as I am fed up not knowing about and not getting any letters to know how all is getting on. I believe all the riots in Dublin have settled, and near time too. If they would come out here they would get plenty of fighting to do without starting up at home. If the poor fellows had the stuff that they destroyed out here they would be glad of it. But it is as well they put an end to it. I think I must draw to a close as my hand pains me still when I use it too much. Excuse a horrible scribble. I now close hoping soon to hear from you. I remain your loving son, John Adams. British Expeditionary Force, somewhere in France, 21st of May, 1916. My dear mother, I am sorry that I have been so long in writing to you again, but I was waiting in the hope that I might get a letter, but another day has passed and still no sign of any. So I have given up hope of getting any of them until I rejoin my regiment, and I hope that will not be long now. I am still in hospital, the same one I was in the last time I wrote. I thought at the time that I would have been out by this time, but my hand was so long in healing up, the doctor thought there must have still been some splinters in it. So he had to open it up again, and got one in the heart of my hand. So it was put back as far as ever. Only it has nothing to do now but heal up, and by the time you get this letter I will be back at my duty again. Many a time I lie and wonder how yous are all getting on at home, but I hope yous are all still in your usual good health. I know it is not your fault, at home, that I am not getting any letters. They come all right to the battalion, but they are endorsed hospital and sent away again, and the letters may go back home again for all I know or I suppose for all the care so long as they get rid of them. They are very nice fellows in the hospital. I know some of them from when we were in Clandy Boy, and they were in Newry for some time, about the time we were on the route march through County Armagh. I am telling you this to let you know that I am not altogether amongst strangers, as you may suppose. I was talking to Sammy Moffat about a week ago. He came to see me. He is just the same. I need not tell you I was glad to see him. It was like a breath from home to talk to him. Those at home cannot realise how much good it does one to meet someone they know out here. It brings fond memories of happier days. And the weather still keeps good and it is almost pleasant. I hope the weather at home is also fine. We will so be into the summer months again. I wonder what it will hold for each of us. It may bring sorrow for some and joy for others. But I suppose whatever comes, it will be for the best, and we will have to put up with it. It is all in a good man's hand, and he knows what is best for each of us. So we will have to leave it at that. Tell Annie and Jimmy that I am asking for them. I hope they are both in good health, as well as yourself. You can tell them that I will write to them as soon as I get back on duty. But this is all the writing paper I have got until I get back. My store of envelopes has run done. If you're writing to Jeannie, you may tell her that I am getting on all right. 
I cannot get writing to her now, but shall do as soon as I get back. I am sending Jimmy a couple of cuttings out of the old newspaper. He might like them. I think this is about all, so I must draw to a close. Hoping to hear from you soon. Good night. I remain your loving son, John Adams. British Expeditionary Force, somewhere in France, 28th of May, 1916. My dear mother, just a few lines to let you know that I am out of hospital once more, and that my hand is a good deal better, although I am still not able for any heavy work, but the captain was so pleased to see me back that he let me run about for a week without doing anything. I have got all your letters and was glad to know that all at home are still in good health. My dear mother, I suppose you will be glad to know that I have got another stripe since I came back. I have been promoted to rank of corporal and am getting staying in my own company. The weather is simply lovely. It is just like summer this afternoon. I suppose you are having good weather at home, for it is very pleasant. I hope Annie and Jimmy and yourselves are keeping well. And you are right to keep fretting. It will do thee a whole lot of good. I am beginning to think that you will never have sense. Well, I may tell you that if I had started fretting over my hand, I would not be back here today. You would have had me home with only one hand, but I kept up my heart, and now see the result of it. Well, I think I have not much more to say. I will write soon again. I remain ever your loving son, John Adams. Thank you for listening to John Adams' Letters from the Front podcast. To find out more about John Adams and his family, visit www.johnadams.org.uk forward slash letters. The History of the Ninth Service Battalion, Royal Irish Fusiliers, during the World War I is taken from the Blackers Boys. Visit them at www.9irishfusiliers.co.uk with the number 9. The podcast will be published a hundred years after the letters were written, so will be published nearly every month. This has been a Mark Smith production.